to um, the February 27th, 2023 Community Service and Public Safety uh, Committee meeting. Zendaya, are we in um, compliance with FOIA? Yes, ma'am, we are. Okay. Can may I ask a favor before we go any further? Can these lights be turned off or down? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, Cindy, will you please call the roll? Ms. Bryson? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Alford? Here. Ms. Becker? Here. Thank you. And Cindy, do we have any appearance by citizens? At this time, I do not see anyone that has signed up. However, if there was anyone that did try to reach out, if you would kind of let me know and we'll get through that. So if there's anyone here who had contacted um, the town hall to um, speak this morning, but wasn't responded to, you are free um, and we welcome you to come forward at this time. Thank you. All right, can I pledge of allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. So, under new business, um, we have a report by the Hilton Head Island Fire Res Rescue by, uh, by Chris Blankenship, Chief. Chief. Good morning. Uh, Chris Blankenship, Fire Chief, for the record. Um, I'd like to start with, uh, since we got some new members, actually a whole new committee this year, and um, I also have new members um, with uh, some introductions, if, if y'all are so inclined. Thank you. Yes. So starting off, um, you all know Joe um Mr. my Deputy Fire Chief. Um, Justin Cunningham, uh, my other Deputy Fire Chief of Operations, he took his position when I moved up. Kathleen Litchfield is our new 911 um, Communications Manager. Tom Dunn, you guys all know. Yep. Emergency Manager, Colin Fanning, Battalion Chief of Safety and Professional Development. Peter Gennaro is our EMS Captain. Russell Rogers is our uh, Deputy Fire Marshal and over the Bureau of Fire Prevention. And Christopher Osterman is our new Battalion Chief of Strategic Planning. He was recently promoted from Fire Inspector, so. Well, welcome. Uh, we appreciate y'all coming out this morning. And I will be remiss if I said that this is my senior team and we could not do anything without them. Um, special shout out to Chief Fister and Chief Osterman for putting this report together for us today. Thank you. Um, maybe we should take a moment um, so that the new council uh, members and this committee can introduce themselves to the new um, members of Fire and Rescue. Patsy, would you like to start us off? Morning, Chief. Good morning. We've met before and uh, Deputy Chief. Deputy Chief, am I saying that right, Joanna? Yes. And the other Deputy Chief? Yes, and uh, Patsy Bryson, I represent Ward 2, uh, which is north end of the island, Hilton Head Plantation, Bay Shore, um, Chinaberry, um, and Squires Gate, and then coming down Gumtree, including the Gullah Museum, back down to the Main Street area. So, um, and I very much enjoyed being at your award ceremony and, and uh, promotion and award ceremony, if I've got all the proper description of that. So thank you very much for that. Very much impressed. And surely on behalf of my ward and all the citizens, appreciate your service to our community. Alex. I'm Alex Brown. I uh, represent Ward 1 here at Town of Hilton Head Island. Uh, Chief, thank you for bringing your team. Um, I'm so happy to have you all with us, but um, wanted to say out loud that, <clears throat> that, you know, the service that this EMS and FIRE uh, perform here on Hilton Head is second to none, all right? Um, I had a little slight experience last week with my father uh, about two o'clock in the morning, and although I could tell that they had just woken up as, as I had, <laughs> they were uh, still very professional, very helpful. So I, I just commend your team and the good work that you all do. Thank you. Steve? Uh, Steve Alfred, basically Sea Pines and a little bit of surrounding territory. Uh, excellent report that you prepared for us. Uh, 
I hope that means it reduces the time you need to take here today, but it was really good. <laughs> it will. I'll go fast. Uh, and I've also enjoyed or participated in the EMS service on several occasions here. You. Found it very good. And I'm Tammy Becker, Ward 4, um, and we welcome you again. Thank you for joining us this morning. I can tell you personally, we know how valuable you are to our family and we thank you. Um, and I know on behalf of our residents across the island <coughs> Ward 4 that they know they can depend on you every single day for the world-class service that you provide. So grateful. Thank you. And you all feel free to stop me um, at any time you have a question um, and there is an opportunity at the end. So we'll start with operations. Last year we had a record-breaking um, uh, call volume year again um, at 9,589 total incidents. And you can see the breakdown there between heavily, heavily EMS as we have been for the last 20 years. Um, we uh, averaged about 26 calls a day last year. So I can tell you as we see that trend going up year to year, the last three years were record years for us. Um, I just did the average for January and, and February and we're at 23 a month. So that as we get into our summer months, that, that drastically goes up. So I see us probably breaking another record this year. Um, our top three busiest days, um, you can see there, uh, 54 and 53 incidents per day, which is a lot for us. Um, 20 year increase of 68% uh, in our call volume. So if we look back for 2002 um, until 2022, we had a 68% increase and you can see by the chart, it's uh, very heavily in the, the EMS section. Um, Councilman Lennox uh, asked a couple years ago for us to start looking at um, our, our busy compared to our budget over the last 20 years. So that's something we've prepared this year. Outside of salary and benefits, our operating budget, which is our day-to-day -day expenditures, um, have only gone, gone up 104,000 in that time, which represents 9% of our overall operating budget, which I think is awesome. I think it shows that we're um, financially responsible and that even though today, our programs and what we do for the community vastly outweigh what we did 20 years ago. We're still trying to operate within that um, fiscal responsibility. Um, busiest day of the year is uh, Saturday, and our busiest month is July. I'm sure no one uh, is surprised by that. Our busiest engine and medic, our, our engine medic five, which is at the front gate of Hilton Head Plantation, which historically has been our busier units. Um, you see our response statistics. We have a three-year increase of 25% which is a lot when we see that still going up. Um, we always like to report on um, our fires. So we had 46 fires actually within a structure last year. 25 of those 46 were contained to the object of origin, um, an oven, a microwave, um, something to that nature. 12 confined to the room of origin, um, one confined to the floor, and eight confined to the actual building. Uh, we like to not only report on what we lost, but what we save as part of our accreditation model as well. So for our total loss of $5,210,000, we had a savings of 86 million, or I'm sorry, 5,210,000. We had a savings of 86 million, which is, is pretty good. Uh, fires by property type, you can see there um, in 2022 compared to 2021, we went up in every single one of these categories from single family to multifamily to uh, dumpster fires. So we had a, a busier fire year in 2022 than we did in 2021. Um, frequent response is something that we look at and this is, as you look at these addresses, I will tell you that that is the Seabrook, that is Bayshore, that is um, Indigo Run, Tide Point and 120 Mott Drive is the um, is uh, life care of Hilton Head behind the hospital. So these are heavily in EMS, um, but this shows you that um, that uh, these five properties um, that we go to the months uh, the most. I want to point out that something we've been looking at and something we're going to be in conversation with um, is Bayshore. So uh, Bayshore is a single standalone building. Um, compare that to the Seabrook, which is five uh, single family buildings and a nursing home. If you look at that, we're running to Bayshore more than like anything else combined. So there's gonna be some conversation there with them, especially as they get ready to um, open the, the cottages across the street. If I may interrupt you a moment, Chief. Um, when you say conversations with them, what what are the issues there that you would think uh, would be addressed? Kind of, we wanna know why. why. Why are we going? So they, they advertise a level of care and 
are they providing that level of care to their to their residents? Um, what we see is is an aging population moving in there and probably not getting the on-site care um, that they've probably been sold there. So, but again, it's just it's alarming that that we go to this one facility time and time and time again. We're averaging about two responses a day there um, here locally, and it's really challenging that station. So last year, we uh, actually January, we were able to um, to add a person to that station with what we were approved last year in the budget. So that's now a split crew. Um, so they have a standalone medic and a standalone engine, which is going to help um, keep service available in that district. But it's just, it, it's alarming to us. It's, it's a trend we're watching. Thank you. Yep. Um, our yard waste um, burning statistics. So as you guys know, we have an ordinance for yard uh, waste burning on Hilton Head. We have 508 active permits. We did 375 <coughs> registered burn inspections last year. We issued 16 warnings and four citations. So those four citations, those are just for uh, burning trash instead of yard waste. May I ask you, yep. um, of, of those, are those where um, the rise in trash dumpsters, etc., is coming from the last statistic, or is this something separate? No, this is. Uh, uh, the, we don't categorize those okay. as the trash burns. Those are dumpsters and actual. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, our operational benchmarks. So, as part of our accreditation model, um, we set benchmark times and we try to meet them. Um, as you can see here, uh, we did not meet in our fire base any of the categories. Um, I, I kind of want to point out our alarm handling time, um, a significant increase here. That is due to we're, we're short staffed in dispatch. We have brand new dispatchers that go through six plus months of training. Um, so there's a natural slowdown progression there. But with that uh, 32 second um, increase there, we've made up that difference. This difference in that we're, we're only seven seconds behind our benchmark. So this is something that we continually look at every five years as part of the accreditation model. We set those times. We've had the same times for probably the last 20 years. So that's something that we'll continue to, to monitor and work towards. Do you, uh, I gather you're suggesting that the alarm handling time delay is going to be corrected probably soon. Yeah, so we've actually, um, as part of that too, we've implemented minted in January, uh, especially on the EMS side of things. We have um, a different model of EMS. So we now run non-emergent single ambulances to a certain level of calls, and that call processing time really doesn't matter because it's considered a non-emergent call. We run a, another, uh, the secondary level, which is the closest ambulance emergent. And then the next one is the closest ambulance and met and engine company emergent. Um, and then the final is our cardiac arrest, which has not changed. That's the closest ambulance, the next two closest units, and the battalion chief to that. So all of these numbers, I think, on the EMS side, you're definitely going to see change. But I, I think you'll definitely see us get back to this, to this four-year trend as we get certified and experienced dispatchers back in our dispatch center. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief, if I could ask a question, uh, is there a national average or an NFPA standard? There is an NFPA standard um, with everything. It's, it's, a, it's a guideline, and uh, we the difference between an NFPA standard and, and accreditation is accreditation says what works for your department. You know, we have unique things on this on this island. We're not in a gridded street New York City system, which I will tell you NFPA, a lot of it is based on inner city standards. Um, we don't we don't have that capability here. We never will. Um, we don't have a gridded street system. Um, so our response times are ever changing over the years. We put in emergency access gates to help us with that. Um, but there is a, a standard, but I would say it's more on the guideline of it. And this model is community specific like our times would not be the same as Bluffton's they would not be the same as Savannah's because they look at your actual community and what is involved in doing that I would say the only thing here the alarm handling time is more of a standard than the turnout time because it shouldn't matter where you are it should take you the amount of time to get, get dressed and get to the to the truck so it's really the the travel time um, is the is the big uh, difference thank you yes oh. Yeah, Chief, this, this chart was rather interesting to me. Um, and a couple of the comments that you've made um, around this has triggered some, some other thoughts. Um, you mentioned that um, once you get some more dispatch in-house, this will change. Is there a plan to 
um, assured that you're going to have more of those employees that you need? We do. We um, we actually one started this morning. She's actually over here in this hallway doing her HR stuff. Um, we've we've been ch it's been challenging to get dispatchers in. We've mm -hmm. we've had I'd say three or four in the last six months that have come and not made it out of orientation. Um, it's it's a challenging schedule. It's a very challenging um, position. I can tell you that there's no way I could do it. Um, so the ones that that can do it and can do it great, we it's awesome. But it's it's challenging to get them in. So this last year we've taken some initiatives. Um, we've upped the pay um, to make sure we're competitive across the market and actually put ourselves over over the rest of the market here locally. But it's it's challenging like with everything else. Uh, we're as of this morning we're we're only two dispatchers short. Mm -hmm. But there's just time and training with that. Um, we do have some community outreach um, stuff going on with, with dispatch since Kathleen came on um, that not only us on the line side are going out and trying to get our local um, population to, to apply, but now uh, our dispatch center is doing the same thing. Okay. So, and, um, Two missing of how many? Uh, there's 13 total. 13? Thir 13 on the floor and then Kathleen. And how's that percentage uh, compared to your staffing uh, shortages? Uh, company-wide so happy to say that currently as of this morning we're two dispatchers short and we're only two short on the line with already a plan we have one coming on in um or we have two more coming on on the line with the next academy okay good so we're actually compared to last year our staffing is is much better good and um the other question i have and not necessarily that this is uh germane to your responsibilities but i like to use you guys as a as a good case study uh, do you have any idea as to what percentage of your staff actually lives on hilton head uh not currently i will say you it, I will, i'll tell you it, it drops every year um i can tell you just in in my staff um which i track um chief fister and i are the only ones that live on hilton head in the in the senior staff um on the line it 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 drops every year um we're seeing a trend of more of our newer people are having to live in uh, Pooler, Rinkin, even Hardyville is starting to get expensive um, to live on, on the, the salary. So it's it's alarming. So we are, I mean, it's part of our community outreach. We are, we're in the high school. We're now in the middle school. Tomorrow we have, I think, 30 middle schoolers um, coming doing a half day with us to kind of get them involved and, and interested. We're starting a high school cadet program this year, which will bring three people that are interested in the fire service and dispatch into our facility and as like a part-time job um, to say, hey, you know, here's here's something else. Here's another idea, a uh, career path for you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's something we're definitely working on. Thank you for that, Chief, and thank you for your efforts. I, <coughs> those uh, those questions are more uh, to get answers for us on the diets to think about. <laughs> uh, as we see this trend of, you know, level of service, um, and Chief, of course, has an expectation, I think, as we embark upon housing in our community, understanding that a level of service when it comes to our fire and rescue could also be negatively affected if we're not aggressive with housing. So thank you, yeah, Chief. It's, yep. Housing is something I look at uh, almost daily. Um, so it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I would just request that um, as you're looking at that and, and those um, numbers become more clear, um, Give us that feedback yep. so that we know, you know, what it is that we are truly trying to provide with regard to housing yep. so that we're satisfying the needs of, a, of, of certainly the fire and rescue, if not everyone, obviously. Yep. I can have that yep. to you by the end of the week. Thank you. <coughs> so this is our EMS. Um, sorry, Chief. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask one more question about response time? We're, uh, the town's putting in this new adaptive traffic signal system, and my recollection is that fire departments have a way of... Uh, uh, altering the signaling mm -hmm. at intersections. Are y'all working with the other town staff and the consultant or the contractor to make yeah. sure that uh, <clears throat> you'll still have the control of the signals when you need them? Yeah, so we actually met with community development on Friday um, to assure that that nothing's gonna change on our, we, we control the, the, the stoplights as we come through with lights and sirens. Um, that system as part of this does not change Great. with the adaptive. However, what does change is we believe that with the cameras, focused in on the crosswalks 
that will actually help our our time of changing the signals because it'll it'll read if um, someone's in the road because currently if we take control of the signal and it's in the middle of a countdown, it's going to continue to count down yeah. until it changes for us. But with the cameras, they think that it, if it sees that there's no one there, it will go ahead and, and change. So we, we feel and we're hopeful that it actually is gonna be better for us. Great, yeah. thank you. Um, like I said, this was our e EMS time, um, our alarm handling time uh, was actually the only one we did meet on this one, which um, is, is great. Uh, typically our EMS um, is, is a more time sensitive um, uh, call than um, a typical fire alarm or anything like that. And total response time of 8.05, we're only one second short, so. Uh, fire incidents by station. So this is an actual um, fire um, alarm, fire, anything like that that happens in that planning zone. So station one continues to be our busiest. Um, station seven, the Marshall Road, our second. Station five, three, four, six, and two down, down the way. Is Station 1 so busy because of Caligny Circle? No, Station 1 is busy because it has the probably the most fire alarms in it. Uh, the buildings with fire alarms and sprinkler systems and everything like that. That's, that's what we typically run out of that station on fire responses. Um, EMS, you'll see that Station 5, uh, the front gate of Hilton Head Plantation, is our busiest station followed by one, um, and then four has made, since uh, we talked about Bayshore earlier, um, has made a significant um, run on the call stats, and we were able to, in January, as I told you, get that, um, that staffing. So right now, the staffing at station five and one is now the same, uh, station four is the same as that, so split two and two. Um, emergency medical calls, so in 2022, we had a total of 6,313 total patients that we build. Of those, 4,963 patients were in South Carolina, and you can see, um, you know, Florida or Georgia was our next closest, North Carolina and Ohio, and then basically the where the advertising for Hilton Head has has gone over the course of the last 30, 40 years. Um, EMS uh, net revenues collected, so another record-breaking year last year, um, not only call-wise, but our EMS uh, collections. So you guys passed an ordinance last year bringing us more in line with the national standard. That will actually change as that standard. It'll be an automatic thing that the town will set every year. Um, I, I think that's awesome um, that we're actually collecting. Uh, we have a 68% collection rate, which is far better than the rest of the nation. That is typically because most of our patients are Medicare, Medicaid patients. There's kind of like an automatic pay there, um, but our collection is, is very, very good. This might be a good time to ask the question with regard to the, um, how often e EMS, how often we're transporting from the ER to another hospital. Yep. Uh, so how that impacts. Um, I have, a, so can I, I have a slide have kind a of slide on that. So that. Um, let me get okay. to that. So our average, um, here's our average age, as you can see, um, th this is Hilton Head, um, the 65 to 84 year old um, demographic is, is our biggest um, patient. Mm -hmm. um, about, about an even male to female ratio. Um, our cardiac survival uh, rate, so out of a total 52 total um, cardiac arrests, uh, 25 of them were witnessed. That's the ones that we focus on. That's the ones that we think we can save. Um, and unfortunately, only four last year were able to um, be revived in the field and actually walk out of the hospital. So a lot of times we will get a pulse um, back in the field and they ended up um, passing in the ER or in the hospital later. We don't count them in that. These are the ones that actually walk out, but that's still better than the national average 10%. Um, so, and you all got to see, you know, what that's like at the awards banquet to, to see that is very, very impactful. Um, the inner facility transport, so um, Inspector to, to talk on that. So we met with the hospital, we've met with the hospital several times over the last few years. Um, last year, they were able to get a contract back with a private carrier to help alleviate the inner facility transports that we're doing. So 2021, we did 54, and that is from picking a patient up at Hilton Head Hospital and taking them to another hospital. So Savannah, or usually Charleston, sometimes Augusta. So down from 54 to 25, which I still think is too many. Um, and then the inner facility transports from the hospital to the airport. This is when they're gonna fly a patient out since the hospital does not have a helipad, they land at the airport. We pick up the flight crew, we take them to the hospital, they pick up the patient, we take them back to the helicopter. So th those calls went down a little bit. 
So, uh, Ms. Becker, what you're speaking of, that we're, we're seeing more of a trend. Um, the last two years over the holidays, we, we saw this pick up. Um, and then, it, obviously, the last couple weeks, um, the hospital has asked us to kind of work with them. Um, they, they're not going to go on diversion because diversion means a whole separate thing. Mm -hmm. um, they've asked us to, to call in our patient reports, and they will triage them over the phone and, and decide if it's best if they come to Hilton Head, which is overcrowded, or if it's best for them to go to Tidewatch or Coastal because they have a lower um, call volume and a higher bed availability. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, by doing that, it takes our units off the island. Um, we do have an internal standing rule that only two of them are allowed to be off the island at one time, so we can still provide good coverage. But it also allows them to be seen sooner. So for instance, if we transport a low acuity patient to Hilton Head Hospital, and there's only, or there's no beds available, they might sit in the hallway for 45 minutes to an hour on our cot before they're seen, or they could be triaged and placed in the waiting room. Um, there's a very large misconception um, of the community that if you call 911 and go by ambulance, you automatically get a bed. That's, that's not true. If there's no beds available, there's no beds, beds available. So um, we have met with the, the CEO of Hilton Head. We've, we've voiced our concerns. Um, I think at this point, um, and I've talked to him in person several times, at this point, um, I think it's probably your guys' job to have conversations with them about how we can better provide um, the care that our citizens need. Thank you. Okay. Uh, patients are uh, receiving naloxone, which is Narcan. So I will preface this with, in 2022, we gave Narcan to 65 patients. That doesn't mean we had 65 overdoses. Um, I'm pretty sure we, we track, you know, with DMAP, we, we think we had about 34. Um, we give Narcan as part of our cardiac arrest. If it's an unknown cardiac arrest, um, we'll give Narcan as, as part of that um, response. If it's a younger patient that we don't know why they're in cardiac arrest. Um, so 65 times we gave it, we think we had about 34. However, we met last week with um, the county received a grant um, to, um, it's a statewide thing, um, but it went through the county. And um, it's, it's about Narcan education, follow up and distribution. So uh, last week, so they've been focusing on the rest of the county because the, the, there is a bigger problem with um, overdoses in, in the rest of the county compared to Hilton Head. Um, that we can now start tracking that with them and they plan, they, they're gonna come in and do some education and they can start following up with those known overdoses that we have within 72 hours. So today we go to cardiac arrest, or I'm sorry, today we go to an overdose, a known overdose that we push Narcan and we get them back. They get that information as part of this countywide system. It is mapped and they will follow up with that patient within 72 hours to make sure hopefully it doesn't happen again. So that is, that's good. I think we need to look at the data over the next uh, year, at least, to see what, you know, if that's making any impact on it. Thank you. That's an important issue. I appreciate the update. Yep. Um, just some strengths, uh, some, some training stats um, that, well, you know, 36,000, almost 37,000 hours of training that our people do. So outside of running calls, you know, we still have to train. We have to keep our certifications up. So just this highlights some of the areas that, um, that we're training in. Um, our technical rescue team, you guys probably see emails from me, or you will, about um, what our TRT team does. It's a, it's a regional technical rescue team um, and hazmat team that is funded uh, through Homeland Security granting from the feds. Um, this year, we received 45,000 um, in Homeland Security grants. However, I want to highlight we received a um, uh, million dollars in one-time sustainment funding from the state of South Carolina. So what we've seen is the feds will provide you with equipment, um, but there's certain criteria that you, you can buy things. Um, so the problem, the, all the teams have got together with the state and said, all right, we have all this equipment, but how, how do we deploy it? How do we, how do we get it from here, from Hilton Head to Allendale for a tornado? And they haven't been willing to fund um, vehicles, um, what they call prime movers, to move these. So um, each team was given a million dollars um, in sustainment to try to subsidize that and a lot of the teams are using it um, for prime movers and I'll get into that in the next slide. So our uh, rescue one trailer was placed in the service. That's that tractor trailer that you, you may see um, going up and down the road. Uh, we put a new flatbed truck into service and a 15 passenger van which um, was paid for with that million dollars in sustainment funding. 
Um, we did have four deployments. We went to Allendale um, overnight on the 5th and 6th to help with the tornado that touched down there, did wide area search and damage assessment. We responded to Jasper County to assist with a church fire, uh, shoring of the building uh, so they could do the investigation. We assisted with the missing person in Bluffton on August 29th and October 7th. Um, we went to Sheldon uh, for a mis missing person search as well. Um, these are the two vehicles we bought so far. This bus um, is actually going to replace our, I'm sorry, this van is going to replace our big bus that we've had since 1999. That is just huge and um, doesn't really serve, serve our needs anymore. Um, this truck was bought to, to pull our trailers and this will actually have a big um, gooseneck trailer, uh, logistics trailer that uh, will be coupled with it that is paid for out of that money, out of that grant. Our hazmat team um, had, a, had a couple classes. We're, we're not very uh, heavy in hazmat response. Um, the stuff's there when we need it, um, but we don't actually need it that much. We don't have a lot of hazmat and even surprisingly the area doesn't have a lot of hazmat. Um, even though there's rail in Hardyville and the interstate and stuff, we just, knock on wood, don't have a lot of calls out there. Um, some community, community risk reduction initiatives. So last year we did 3,433 fire inspections. Uh, we found 2,800 violations, um, most of them corrected. Uh, new construction inspections are up, plan reviews are up, fire investigations. Um, we still uh, check our hydrants every year. Uh, we installed 102 smoke alarms, which has already been proven to be beneficial in um, eventually having a fire there that we can now track that, hey, we put that in on this date and we know that it saved life because it got people out. Um, the, the fire in the streets and the after the fire home visits, we did 233. So we go out and proactively go out into communities and talk about um, home evacuation plans. We install smoke detectors and just talk to them about fire safety overall. And then if we do have a fire, we go back out to that community afterwards and basically do the same thing. Um, 25 uh, risk watch um, injury prevention classes. We um, instructed 454 people in uh, CPR, which is awesome. And we did 88 car seat, car seat installs. <clears throat> Uh, emergency management uh, division, busy as always, um, developing IAPs for events and doing after actions. So St. Patty's Day Heritage, we did a tsunami exercise. Um, we had Tropical Storm Ian that we um, hyped up for. Uh, Tropical Storm Nicole, uh, we did the concourse, the Christmas Day freeze um, a couple months ago. And then we did submit um, for our uh, emergency management accreditation, uh, emergency management accreditation in that division, which I'll talk here shortly about. <clears throat> Our dispatch center, we, uh, we took 67,000, just over 67,000 calls um, in the center last year. 30,750 of those were 911 calls. Um, the 13,278 are transfers to other 911 centers, usually Beaufort County for um, police matters. And that just shows our busiest time is, is two to three in the afternoon. And this is a lie because I know Chief Tadlock couldn't also dispatch. So, <laughs> <laughs> but again, this is the, uh, this is a busy center. Um, I believe the last the last couple of years there are about forty five thousand total calls incoming. So, um, getting busier with nine one one calls. Our fleet maintenance um, division ever growing um, with our aging fleet. They've been very busy um, the the last couple of years. We're we're already two years behind on our fleet replacement, as you guys know. Um, I will update you that it is now expected January or February of 2024 for the new fleet. And with build times being three years, um, I will be coming next year before you to um, fund uh, the replacement of our tiller trucks um, because we know it's going to take three years to build them. Some accomplishments um, put uh, about a third of our personnel through uh, National Registry and T refresher last year. Um, that's an online refresher. Uh, nine people um, successfully completed paramedic course, which I will tell you that we found out on Friday that we got a roughly $400,000 grant to fund paramedic school over the next two years. So that is huge. Um, uh, kudos to my, to my EMS division and Marcy Benson for getting that grant through and uh, successfully getting it. Uh, we implemented um, NIMS training for all town staff. Um, we also this year are going to do um, CPR and AED training for all town staff. 
We held uh, annual meetings with our public-private partners, including the utilities, the gated community, security, healthcare facilities um, on emergency management. We hired Kathleen and five full-time dispatchers and three part-time dispatchers. So, oh, sorry, to get us through some of this dispatching issues we're having in the, the prolonged onboarding of them, we, we did hire three part-time experienced people um, that have been, that have drastically helped us get through this time. Um, comprehensive audit, audit of the community um, use AEDs. Um, we are, that there's a planned replacement of those in the coming year uh, due to age. We added 70,000 non-inspectable multifamily properties to RMS. Formalized and documented a repeatable after action process that captures strength and opportunities um, in Microsoft Teams. So everything we do, we after action. Our fires, we after action. Our cardiac arrests, our community events, um, everything. We after action to find opportunities for improvements um, for the next time. Um, restructured the comprehensive training program to better serve the needs of the department and the firefighters that came straight out of our strategic plan. And if you all aren't on it, please do. We launched our Fire Rescue Facebook page, which um, I think is awesome. And I credit uh, Chief Fister with that. Um, she's the one that manages it. Um, CIP projects, we replaced all of our extrication tools, which is our, people call them the jaws of life. Um, with, uh, we went from hydraulic uh, powered ones to um, hydraulic battery powered ones, which is the new state of the art. Uh, we replaced two staff vehicles. Replace the 20 year old fleet maintenance uh, vehicle lift so now we can actually work on our, our newer ambulances. Um, and a 9 simula simulator for use in recruitment and training efforts. So, to talk, um, Alex, about your thing, we bought a simulator that basically we can take out to the schools, community events, and everything. And we can let people see what they actually do in real life and let them kind of play with it as well. So, I think that's going to be huge in recruitment. So, upcoming initiatives. Um, Coming before you this year will be a, an addressing ordinance. Um, we've kind of already put the steps in play. Um, we're just asking you guys to, to approve them. And um, it's, it's just a, a better plan altogether through um, Public Planning Commission and the planning group um, and fire rescue. Um, we're gonna do some training center upgrades. We've had our training center for 20 years and we, we have done nothing, no upgrades to them. Um, the last two chiefs, their, their thought process was we're not gonna do anything to that until we get all of our Fire stations built. Well, our fire stations are built, and that's our next big initiative um, is to to get some upgrades there. The Emergency Management Accreditation Program application for emergency management and urban search and rescue. It's called EMAP. We will be submitting our, our paperwork this year um, to become accredited in both of those. Uh, community outreach initiatives um, are, are ongoing. Um, I will tell you, there are a few positions I put in this year um, in the budget for your consideration. One of them is a community outreach um, person to basically, so it's not us continually piling on stuff to, to basically take this to the next level and be out in the community more. It's part of our strategic plan, it's part of the town's strategic plan, and I need someone to head that up, and that will definitely fall into recruitment as well. Look good local recruitment. And uh, also expanding our social media presence. With that, I'll ask any questions. Thank you, that was an incredible uh, report. Very comprehensive, and I love the format. It's really well done, very easy to understand. Um, I'm gonna ask. Council Deal, uh, Steve, do you have any additional questions at this time? No questions. As previously indicated, that was an outstanding report that you prepared for us. Thank Very you. much appreciated. Thank you. Alex? Yep, yeah, Chief, thank you. As always, um, job well done. Um, I, I just encourage you as you uh, bring forth these reports, um, the good news is great, right? And bad news is good too, because as we continue to challenge ourselves with this performance of excellence as a town, that things are not going so well, uh, speak freely to us, okay? So we can support you in budgeting, all right? Yes, I yep. appreciate that. Speaking of budgeting, I just heard uh, you're probably gonna ask for a new staff member, uh, community, uh, community outreach. Any other new, per I don't wanna usurp no, the town manager's process, budget <laughs> process, but a forecast of a number of personnel, Absolutely. equipment, you yep. need a new station or a station rehab, kind of tell us what we might nope, be so, looking for. Um, absolutely, I will, I will preface this with, um, since Mark came in, uh, he has been instrumental in, in, in helping us. Um, he's made us a, a, a top priority of his. Um, last year we were able to do, um, within the approved budget, a little internal compensation um, uh, hike for our, our people to, to be more competitive across, across the area, especially which has definitely helped with our retention. Um, 
we, I, I brought forth um, probably six positions this year um, that we've needed for a long time. We've, um, for 20 years, if you look at our staff with the addition actually of, of just a, Christopher's position, um, which was new this year, our staff has looked the same for the last 20 years. So I focused this year on on the staff and not the line. So two years ago, I got the three people on the line. We had a dispatcher. Um, this this year, I focused on on staff. So I believe we need an inspector, another inspector. We don't inspect every property in Hilton Head. We probably never will, unless we have a staff of 12. Um, but I feel we, um, and Chief Fister feels we fall short in what we could do. So I think um, that another inspector is definitely going to help. A mechanic, um, we've we've gone kind of backwards. Um, Keith is the fleet manager, but he's also a wrench turner. So he's trying to manage the overall fleet of the town and our vehicles and all of our small equipment and everything, but he's also out every day turning wrenches. I need him to manage um, and get someone else in there. We've looked at outsourcing um, some of the maintenance stuff. It's not feasible. Um, we have a standard um, that we have to live up to. And if we outsource our vehicles to someone else, we don't know. Um, one, the timeline that's going to take to fix our vehicles, or the, the if they're living up to the same standard. Um, in EMS, uh, we need better QA and QI in our EMS. So I asked for a, a position in our EMS division that will um, be able to do billing, uh, quality improvement, and quality assurance. Um, a social media and marketing. I think we fall short in marketing um, fire rescue. Kelly's done a phenomenal job in her in her group up here. Um, I feel we, we try not to use them. We really don't use them um, because they're at capacity here. I feel we need someone there. I have a deputy chief doing social media. I don't think that's right. I think there's other things she should be doing. So the community outreach and the social media thing will be um, a big division in, it, in itself. Well, two people, but uh, a lot of movement out there in, in the community. So a total of six positions. I think I got them all. Emergency management coordinator. So um, we used to have one. We got rid of one. Tom Dunn is doing more now. He's doing more town-wide stuff. Um, he's doing more internally with us, um, and that allows him to, to get someone some help in there and, and hopefully um, a succession plan in that division as well. How about equipment or buildings? So all of our fire stations, uh, we're built out for fire stations. Um, equipment, we're, we're good. We have the continued equipment, um, which is our, our turnout gear um, that has life cycles and stuff like that. Um, I mean, our, our, we, have a, we have a 10 year capital plan. Um, so we actually have everything, you know, and I think next year our cardiac monitors are up. Um, but we have, we have a plan for all of that. So um, I would say anything we put into capital is, is important, is needed. Um, we are seeing, you know, we had a 10 year life cycle for our trucks. We've had a lot happen in 10 years. We had, we had a pandemic, we had a hurricane, um, we pushed back stations. Um, so now that, that once that fleet gets here, we'll be a lot better positioned. Um, so, I mean, I appreciate everything you all have done. Um, with, with our capital stuff. Uh, like I said, the training center upgraded, upgrades are needed. Um, I know the town is looking at, you know, we've done an assessment this year on fire rescue headquarters and town hall, which is our two most aged buildings. Um, you know, we're in a, we're, we're in a manufacturing makeshift uh, warehouse that we've kind of converted and, and put some stuff on for the last years, but we're, we're about at capacity for that building. So I think a, a fire rescue headquarters at, at some point um, we'll, we'll come for you, but that is, you know, Mark's doing assessments on both of those right now. Great. Thank you. Yep. Well, again, thank you and welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to make my um, public service announcement that I make every time I get the op opportunity. Our lives were saved because of um, uh, being alerted by a smart smoke alarm in our home. They work 100%. The Fire in the Streets program is wonderful, and I love that outreach. To anyone who's listening, please spread the word to everyone that you know that to make sure that A, you have fire alarms in your home, and secondly, that you've changed the batteries and that they're properly functioning. And um, Fire and Rescue does the very, very best they can, which is a phenomenal job, but do your part by getting that signal inside your home telling you to get out so they can do their job. Um, so thank you for all of that. Thank you. Thank you all.
All right, so next on our agenda, it is report day, and we are happy to welcome the Beaufort County Sheriff's Office of Hilton Head Island Crime Data Oak Quarterly uh, Report. Um, Mr. Purdy. And I'm actually going to Oh, you are? Yeah. Well, Angela. Um, Mad so Madam Chair, may I ask? I, I, I love seeing all our fire uh, department staff here if they need to go back to work. Can we release them? <laughs> oh, well, certainly. You're welcome to stay, but uh, I'll leave it to the chief to tell you what to do. Take the pressure off. I figured you, chief would know what to do. I, I'm going to take the lead okay. because we have had a transition yes. um, in our enforcement division since the last time I think we met. And I'm going to introduce Major Jeff Purdy. Um, Jeff transitioned over to the Southern Enforcement Commander about six months ago. Yeah. Um, he's got nearly 30 years in law enforcement here in Beaufort County. He's primarily worked north of the Broad River, um, but has also spent some time on our special teams. And then Captain Fawcett was promoted, and he is on his 25th anniversary date today. So, happy um, anniversary. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, just I provided you guys with third and fourth quarter. We did not appear during the third quarter, so the numbers are there if you want them. Um, get this going. Um, also included in the packet um, for the fourth quarter, we have given you the NIBRS report for the last three years for the Beaver County Sheriff's Office in general, not just for the town of Hilton Head. So, going through, oh, that's third quarter, let's get fourth quarter. Where's, where's your... Unless she has combined them. Okay. Well, we're going to do it all together then. I'm happy to report that on all fronts across the county in the last three years, our crime stats are down significantly. Um, I know manpower shortage has been a hot topic of conversation um, with public safety across the country. And yes, we are short. Um, I'll be completely transparent with that. However, um, we are moving in a more aggressive manner for recruiting. We still have staffing to support the needs of our communities. So I'm um, just going to go through that. Um, the crimes against property have decreased as well as the crimes against persons. But one thing that I want you guys to take note of is the property crimes uh, fourth quarter for um, 2022, um, we're going to address mainly the uh, larcenies, which is 73. Although it is down significantly from um, fourth quarter last year, we as a community need to um, be a little bit more aggressive with our choice of safety over our choice of convenience. Because I will venture, and, and we talk about this uh, week after week, um, car break-ins are a significant issue for our community, both on and off island gated communities and our non-gated communities. Um, and that is because we have become complacent in locking our doors and taking our valuables inside. Um, we held community meetings last week in Wexford. We had a community meeting with the Oakview community last week. And we have a forthcoming community meeting with Hilton Head Plantation. And, and our, our hot topic mainly is the larcenies and car break-in. So what we need to do is be more aggressive when we think, oh my gosh, should I lock my car? Well, I'm not worried about it. I'll go back in the morning. You become basically a victim in that thought and not doing what you're thinking about. Um, the, the main thing that I think I want to talk to you guys about are vehicle collisions. And you will see through your vehicle collision analysis that we had four fatalities in the fourth quarter alone on Hilton Head. We had six for the year, okay? Four of those fatalities of the six were vehicle versus pedestrian or vehicle versus bicycles, okay? 
and I'll recount those with you. February 11th, we had a single vehicle collision on the Cross Island where one female um, passenger in a vehicle died. April 17th, we had a vehicle versus pedestrian on Spanish Wells at Bryant Road. Um, that was at dusk. On October the 8th, we had a single vehicle versus tree. Uh, the driver was charged with felony DUI. November 7th, Palmetto Parkway, we had a vehicle versus bicyclist. Uh, that was around midnight. November 15th, we had another pedestrian on William Hilton Parkway in Spanish Wells at 6.45 p.m. That was actually a hit and run. December the 14th, we had another vehicle versus pedestrian on William Hilton Parkway and Palmetto Parkway, and that was after dark at 9.05 p.m. And although not in the fourth quarter, on January the 15th, around 11 p.m., we had another vehicle versus pedestrian at William Hilton Parkway in the Speedway at 421 um, William Hilton. So all mainly within the same corridor of our highway. And it's that business between um, Beach City Road and Matthews Drive. So I'm hoping that um, with the project you guys have going on. I have not been a part of any of those meetings recently. I don't know, Andy, if you have. Um, some of those curb cuts and stuff are going to be addressed, um, and I hope that we come to a solution where we have more lighting in our crosswalks or something to help our, our pedestrian population. So if I can just um, ask a question related to that and then go back um, okay. to the previous topic for just a moment. So. When you, when you, that's a great statement, and, and I appreciate the information. It helps us with um, looking forward. Are you suggesting that the um, accidents occurred within a crosswalk area or is outside of crosswalk area, but all crossing, essentially, they're, they're from one all, side to the other of 278? All crossing, and if you think about the stretch of road between Beach City Road and Matthews Drive, mm -hmm. The amount of curb cuts and the lanes that the pedestrians must cross to get from one side of the road to the other. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have a crosswalk at Matthews Drive in 278. Mm -hmm. You have a crosswalk at Palmetto Parkway. Um, and I believe there is a crosswalk in front of Northridge Plaza. But it's very dark mm -hmm. at night. I mean, I don't know how often you guys are motoring after 9 o'clock on Hilton Head. Um, but it's very dark. And they're choosing convenience a lot of times and not crossing in the crosswalk mm -hmm. because there is that large break between say the gas station and the next crosswalk. So I think more lighting in addressing the vast amount of roadway that they have to cross because if you think about it, there may be six lanes, six or eight lanes that they're having to maneuver to get across that one little stretch of road. Mm -hmm. May I assume that you've talked to MKSK about that? We have spoken um, is that the company that is doing the assessment? Yes. We participated in one of the initial meetings, and I think um, Fire EMS also echoed some of the curb cut issues that we have in that general area because it's not only the pedestrian traffic, it's traffic turning out onto the roadways as well. Okay. And then just um, backing up to the car break ins. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, public. Uh, Notice, please lock your cars. Yes. Take your valuables out of your cars. You mentioned that there were um, some community engagements that mm -hmm. you're holding, and that's great. Are there any of those types? Well, two questions. Um, first, are any of those types of community engagements being um, held for outside the community, um, the gates communities? As far as so, so, so we, who's initiating? Is it the POA? They, that yes, they have asked us to speak, um, and a lot of it on, is on crime prevention. We offer. So I have a team of folks. I have a, a social media expert. I'm going to call her an expert because she does a fantastic job. And I also have a crime prevention specialist, and Mass Sergeant Danny Allen. He will come out and speak to any organization or any community that needs him to come speak. Okay. Um, we do um, active shooter training in many of the businesses and churches and schools. We do crime prevention talks wherever we're invited to go. We have um, officers, I believe, today at the um, primary school talking about law enforcement and whatnot. But anytime any group wants us to come speak, we are happy to be there for them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Can I, can I come back to, you, you listed a lot of different vehicle versus pedestrian vehicle versus bicycle. Mm -hmm. Was that all in the fourth quarter? That was, okay. There are four fatalities in the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. and that is October, November, December. October the 8th, we had a vehicle versus tree. And are all these fatalities? Yes, ma'am. Because I, I, I thought I heard more than four. That's why I was wondering what the total was. I talked about the total for the year is six. Okay. And then coming off of the fourth quarter in January, we had another one in the same area. And I just spoke about those because I think it's very important that we focus on what's going on there. So a total of six for the year 2022. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, any is too many, but yes, I just wanted to make sure I had that number. Um, <clears throat> part of the... Uh, Pardon me, the strategic uh, planning um, done during our uh, town council workshop in January was to include adoption of a complete streets policy, mm -hmm. which would look at not just vehicular uh, patterns, but also pedestrian and bicyclist patterns. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be adopting that this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful I'm looking at Madam Chair to see uh, if she can work with the town manager and the mayor to get that on our agenda as soon as we can. Uh, it may help, um, and as uh, Mr. Alfred has mentioned, MKSK are a consultant over that quarter, uh, which includes the area that you've described. Um, I think maybe there might be some other opportunities for you to have input, and I hope that you will. I know that's going to come before, I think it's our public planning committee, um, maybe next month. I can't remember what the calendar says, but it might be good to have your input during that time um, so that we pay attention to it uh, because especially in that North Fork uh, area, North Ridge area, uh, our bicycle um, advisory committee now, Bike Walk, Hilton Head Island, has been pointing out that issue. Mm -hmm. And as you talk about the number of lanes to cross there, there's no pedestrian safety median in that area. Yeah. Um, and, and lighting is another issue that we've tried to address over the years. But please continue to have some input there because your input helps us to make a difference. Yeah, I, I think that there may be two signalized crosswalks on the island, and that is Mid Island at Yacht Cove and then down at um, Caligny Beach. So, yeah. Good morning again. Um, you mentioned the uh, community meetings. Mm -hmm. um, one was Wexford. Mm -hmm. Where did that meeting take place? That was on Tuesday of last week. We also held one on Wednesday, a follow-up with the Oakview community. Mm -hmm. But the Wexford meeting, where, where did that one take In place? Wexford. In Wexford. At their okay. request. <laughs> All right. Um, I, this is an ask, okay? okay. <clears throat> as, as you all uh, come before us with these reports, could we also add a metric of those community meetings mm -hmm. out in the community? Absolutely. I think it's important that we start to reestablish the relationship between the sheriff's office and the community, mm -hmm. um, and not just gated communities, but all communities. And if we can start chipping away at that, I've got some thoughts as to how um, the town can participate with our public safety, safety officer, community development um, department, and so on. Uh, but if you all would take the lead in just reaching out and touching some of these areas, um, I think that would, would go a long way. Okay. So, so following up on that, mm -hmm. um, the report that, that you guys are provided with is incident-based reporting mm -hmm. with some traffic statistics mm -hmm. as well. Um, is there something else that you guys would like to see besides that? And, and I'm going to follow up on the overdose mm -hmm. topic um, because we, we did address that as well. And the Hilton Head Fire's numbers are consistent with ours, but just to follow up on that, there were eight overdose deaths attributed on Hilton Head last year, and we had 37 countywide. So just to kind of follow up on what they were speaking of, um, there are a lot of things that we do that, that are not captured in statistics, like mental patient transports. I could, if 365 days a year, we've probably done 300 outside of Beaufort County from our hospital facilities because there's not a resource here for them aside from Beaufort Memorial. Um, and that is something that impacts our community as a whole is the lack of resources there. Um, so overdoses, community meetings, community engagement. So one of the benefits that we had with regard to being able to provide an answer mm -hmm. um, in questions for fire and rescue is we had the benefit of having the report ahead of time to review. 
So one of my strong requests mm -hmm. is that for the next um, time y'all come before us, please try to get that to us, mm -hmm. you know. Timely. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. It makes it a lot easier um, for us to be able to tell you more specifics. Um, I do have a, another re a question. Okay. You mentioned that um, one of those deaths was a hit and run. Yes, ma'am. What's the follow-up? Was there a... Uh, the, any accident fatalities within Beaufort County that are not <coughs> investigated by the municipal police agency, i.e. the town of Bluffton or the city of Beaufort, the highway patrol works. Um, any significant injury or risk of death, we defer those accidents to the highway patrol. So I would not be able to answer that for you. So we don't know whether or not the person was ever apprehended or? I do not know. So those are important statistics mm -hmm. too. Um, Another one would be how many of these types of incidents um, can be related to perhaps things speeding mm -hmm. um, in any number of different. So breaking that oh. down for us helps, okay. uh, helps us know which are the factors most um, prevalent okay. that we should obviously <coughs> address them all and try to provide a safe community. But um, knowing where the hot points are is important. Okay. Um, and then two other things, uh, Alex um, and I were on the same page, I think, with regard to community involvement. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I asked about um, who had initiated that. Mm -hmm. if, if we could develop a strong, really stronger relationship with our sheriff's department here on the island, giving the type of information that you provided to Wexford mm -hmm. and the other communities um, to those areas across the island, outside the gates, who may not know how to organize and ask y'all to come in. Okay. Big benefit to everyone with regard to that. And you mentioned in your initial statement that y'all were down yes, in terms of personnel. How many people? 37 countywide. 37 countywide. And typically, um, how many um, chefs have you are on the island at any time. Do we have a, a number roughly? That That is a tricky question. Mm -hmm. And I say that because we have a team of folks that are strictly answering calls for service. Not one call for service or non-emergency call for service. They are deployed via our dispatch center. But at any given time, you may have 15 or 20, depending on what is going on. Because we have civil process folks that are responding to calls for service. We have beach assignments during the summer that are responding to calls for service. We have a team of investigators that are responding to calls for service. So, and, and I'll give you, I know this, um, there was a specific event um, recently in the Oakview community. We were involved in, in a manhunt um, and there were 15 people deployed to just that one call and it was after business hours. So at any given time, you may have anywhere from 10 to 25 or 30. It just, it depends on um, the priority of the call. So those are those who are responding to calls. Just on a general nature though, those who might be on the island checking for speed and, and various six, other things. Six to eight. Six to eight. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Oh, thank you for oh, your patience. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, a couple of, first I'd like to say that the um, I have attended the active shooter training oh, good. Uh, presentations and found them to be excellent um, was that with uh, Danny Allen Danny Allen yeah uh, a couple of matters um, first uh, bicycle accidents and uh, I'm not sure whether that's your jurisdiction or Mr. Bromage's jurisdiction but it, it's very helpful for us to have statistics on uh, bicycle collisions. And that's primarily uh, bike auto collisions where they occur in the frequency and so forth. Uh, but as I say, I'm not sure whether it's your responsibility, uh, Mr. Bromage, or, or yours, Ms. Veens. Okay. So is, is that a statistic that you would like Absolutely. added to our accident? Yeah, right now, now. You, you've got a, this red reference here that says bicycles, but there's no information there. Okay. Um, so yes, we would like 
uh, that type of information. Uh, my other question is a follow-up on Ms. Bickers, and that is, is staffing levels. Uh, how many patrol vehicles are there supposed to be on the island at any one time? So, south of the Broad River, there is there are 12 enforcement officers. No, I'm just talking about the people in, in the vehicles. That, <coughs> that, that, is that your that, uh, that major printing? Is that your responsibility? Yes. Th that could, again, going back to Mr. Brown's question, there are 12 enforcement assigned deputies per shift, okay? And those are your primary folks that are responding to calls, okay? okay? On the island today, I can tell you that in addition to the 12 that are spread out between the greater Bluffton area and Hilton Head, there are one, two, three, four, at least eight to 12 depending on our investigators and our administrative staff. Yeah, I'm just talking about patrol cars. We all drive patrol cars. So I, I'm... Yeah, I'm not looking for investigation type situations. I'm looking for response to cars. incident situations. Well, again, that, that is a, a priority call situation. If we have, for instance, a shooting call at Hilton Head High School, Okay, not only are you going to get every officer that's working on Hilton Head, you're going to get every civil response officer and every school resource officer. And that may be upwards of 15 to 20 people. Yeah, well, let me take a single uh, incidence, which is drunken driving in a gated community. Mm -hmm. I, I can speak about that because I'm, I'm well aware of that. Okay, when our calls for service come in, priority of life and safety is, is our number one. And I think that I can speak on that for all of the first responders in here. That incident in Sea Pines, we take our calls on priority. That night, we had 15 people on the island, not during business hours, so it wasn't in, you know, people that just happened to be there, responded to the Oakview community because there was an incident going on with a gentleman that had been terrorizing that community for months. And I think Mr. Brown and Mr. Ames are both aware of that. Okay, that took priority over a drunk driver who, is my understanding, had been stopped and the threat to the population had been stopped because that person was detained. And, and sometimes we have to come to a resolution that may not be taking that person to jail. Okay, and, and I am aware that the response to that was over an hour, but the there was no response to that. Uh, there, there was because we also deferred your community to the South Carolina Highway Patrol. Okay, but our priority that night was ensuring that Mr. Edmonds was incarcerated, and that's what we did. All right, and that's not the went, only situation that has occurred like that. There have been a number of those over the years. No response, delayed response, and so on. Again, it, it's, it's call priority. So one of the things that I'm interested in, um, in knowing, and I think that that's a conversation, that perhaps that's a good opportunity for y'all to, um, to set up a meeting and go over um, those details on so that everyone has a clear understanding of, of what transpired in that particular incident. But you mentioned something when you were speaking that there was a referral to another agency mm -hmm. when y'all aren't able to get mm -hmm. here in a, a traffic time, in a timely yeah. fashion. Uh, and, and who is that again? It's the South Carolina Highway Patrol. And how, where are they responding from? It, it depends. On so Friday and Saturday nights, they're hovering around the bars for DUI enforcement. So they are here on the island and on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So they're not coming from some distance trying to get here. So okay. sometimes, okay. Sometimes they are, but they they don't work for. Us. I think one of the things that maybe we're all dri driving at is the idea um, that the, that routine type of, um, and not just necessarily the responses, but the that the opportunity for enforcement of things that could cause some of the accidents we've been talking about, some of the break-ins that we've talked about, whether or not we're apprehending DUI drivers, which is a critically important issue, mm -hmm. right? We don't want someone to be back on the road in endangering people's lives. We know that's a problem when that sort of thing happens. But also with the car break-ins, a statistic sh uh, showing us that there's been some, uh, some 
hate to say it because I know they're mostly younger folks, but you know, some arrests, some, yeah. some, some punishment put forward so that maybe we can um, start alleviating that. And while we all take the ownership of the responsibility to lock our cars, take our things yeah. out, everybody do that, we also are looking for something from the, so that we just don't have a roving band of, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, the the car break ins, unfortunately, I know somebody's going to snicker when I say that's like a game of whack a mole. It's you know you put you put three juveniles at DJJ. They're there for for two or three days, and they get released and come home. And here we go again. It's right. So it's those types of statistics that I think are behind the general statements that would be important for us to know. Like how many are apprehended, how many do go off, but then come back and the cycle begins again. Mm -hmm. Because I think therein lies the bigger concern, right? Okay. To stop that, to see those recidivism rates and how we can sort of play to that piece of the equation down the line. But um, it, thank you. And feel free to continue. Yeah. With no, I, I also, especially. Um, Ms. Bryson and you, Mr. Alfred, welcome you guys to come to our fall session of the Citizens Police Academy, and it will give you more in-depth understanding of all of the things that, that we do besides just enforcement, because yeah. we do provide a lot of services to the community, and we do a lot of things that aren't readily recognized by people because they don't engage with us um, unless they need us. Um, but it, it will start in the fall and just I will send you guys all um, a schedule if you're interested in coming because I think it, it would benefit everyone. All right. uh, one, one final question okay. on the matters that I was discussing before. Uh, you, I believe, indicated that the uh, patrol assignment is 10 to 12 on the island. Uh, 10 what? to 12 south of the Broad River. Sorry. 10 to 12 south of the Broad River. That includes Bluffton. I'm just asking about the island. Okay. And how many is that? It, it could be from six to eight. Six to eight. What was it five years ago? Do you know that? I do not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Oh. Yeah. Um, I think the education piece is important. And I, I see that you are taking notes here and we're not necessarily staying on track with your uh, your handout. Yeah. But that's okay. Because <laughs> that, that information, you know, like... Mrs. Becker said, it's not, it, sure. and I, I there's guess, a lot of <clears throat> underlying information sure. I think that you guys would like to know, not just the stats. Yeah. And, and it is very dry. Stats are difficult. Right? They are. We know, especially as we've identified here, that there are a few missing gaps in terms mm -hmm. of where you'd be able to even collect mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. that would go into that. I'm sorry, Alex. No, no, it's okay. Um, I'm curious as to, you know, what, what you all are using as far as technology is concerned. Um, for monitoring um, some of the questions that are coming from uh, my colleagues here today. I'm wondering if technology is a way to help answer some of those. For an example, we know that we've had some incidents in Oakview mm -hmm. <coughs> that would be considered a hot spot. Mm -hmm. So over a period of time, what type of uh, presence has been in Oakview to answer Councilman Alfred's question, how many, right? Extra I know you can Yeah, I know you, I don't want you to answer mm -hmm. it right now, but as you bring forth these reports, mm -hmm. if we identify certain areas of Hilton Head that have had issues, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that technology can tell us what absolutely. presence happened over a period of time. In multiple ways. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be important as you present to us in the future. Okay. Okay. I actually can give you the extra patrol numbers for Oakview today, if you'd like. If, yes, I, I, we'd yeah. probably all be interested in hearing. Yeah, I'll grab them. Here I'm not. I'm. I'm, I'm just suggesting mm -hmm. that, based on the conversation here today, it mm -hmm. seems as if the reporting that has been this produced is, in the past mm -hmm. may not be acceptable for this new council. Okay. And all I'm saying is that the report can look different and your use of technology to help back up the answers to the questions will be helpful as we move forward. I don't need it today. Yeah, okay. One of the most important things for us to acknowledge right now, because there are lots of questions. There are a lot of questions that our constituents and the residents across the island have mm -hmm. with regard to public safety. And, but I want to make sure that there is also an acknowledgement of the fact of how valuable you are. We do know that behind the scenes, there are all sorts of other things that you're taking place, that you're engaged in, and that you're very helpful. 
I just want to make sure yeah. that you know how much you are appreciated. The underlying questions, I think, are, are great, and I think they'll address not only ours, but we can then be responsive to our residents who are having bigger questions on an ongoing basis. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not going to... I will speak for, for both Jeff and Andy, and probably for Bob. The, their phones ring 24-7. They're attached to us. If anything comes up, pe feel free to pick up the phone and, and call. Um, it's easier to get a direct answer from one of them than it is to, you know, go through the email string and it may be a week later before they find out. Please pick up the phone and call them directly if you have any questions. And I can tell you because I have done that when I've had concerns and always very responsive. Um, we will absolutely appreciate um, those statistics that we've asked for, that data, um, more important than the statistics really. Okay. So I didn't mean to interrupt no, no, your, the no, flow I, of your report, no, but do, we do, do have a lot of questions. And, and, and I, will, I will lay on the sword and tell you this stuff is dry, and it is not reflective of the things that do go on. Um, so taking your concerns, I think that I won't be here the next go round. It will be Jeff. Um, he will have that stuff ready for you. Correct. Probably you. in April, if I had to guess. Anything else? Thank you so, very much. And Ms. Bryson, we will be in Hilton Head Plantation um, coming up soon. So if okay. you like, I will, if you don't get it from Mr. Christian or from um, Chief Gaith Gaither, then um, Jeff, Jeff will reach out to you. I have card. Thank you. Okay. So while, so while the moment is here um, in this community engagement uh, becoming a top priority, I think, as we're looking forward, I'm going to ask, um, I guess, meet with Jeff mm -hmm. to arrange for something that is um, available to those who live outside the gates as yeah. a community meeting and see if we can get them equally informed. Yeah, so okay. so one thing um, that we need to address is probably a location. Yes. Um, our office out. holds about 25 or 30 people, I think, um, comfortably, but beyond that. I'll figure it out. Perfect. I'll work with you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. it's like yeah, I just wanted to uh, just give a, a, a very positive example of that community engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so Mr. Brumage and um, my classmate here were able to pull together a meeting in the, uh, the Wild Horse uh, area. And <clears throat> it was so well done because of course the community wanted to, to unload, okay? But Mr. Allen did a really good job with, with handling uh, the emotions. Um, but but the, the part of it that was really inspiring to me was the town had also brought their community development team out mm -hmm. to offer up other information besides just stats and crime. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the point being, I think the more that we can do with those type of engagement sessions to talk about good news and bad news, the better off we'll be as a community as a whole. Yeah. Right. So it's it's been proven to be successful. It can be done. I think we need to support our town manager and town staff in going in that direction as we start to um, support Ms. Fiennes and, and, and Sheriff and others on their side of it. Um, it's, it's not uh, it's not rocket science. We've already done it before. I think we just need to ramp it up a bit. Absolutely. Talk. Thank you. Talk. Thank you so Thank very you. much. And okay. And next we have on our agenda a consideration of extending the memorandum of understanding between the town of Hilton Head Island and the historic Mitchellville Freedom Park Incorporated. Missy, you have a presentation for us this morning? Well, Good morning. Um, no presentation, um, but included in your packet is the information about the resolution and the extension of the memorandum of understanding um, for your consideration and, and possible possibly forwarding that on to town council for their consideration. Um, also um, in the audience, we have Mr. Ward, the executive director, and the board chair, Ms. Campbell, from Historic Mitchellville Freedom Park. Um, but real briefly, just to um, talk about what is before you today, um, 
there has been an MOU um, and a lease uh, with Mitchellville since 2017. The MOU has been renewed twice, um, in 2019 and 2021. The current memorandum of understanding expires on March 16, 2023, which necessitates the review that's before you today. Um, and then real briefly, the, the changes that are proposed on the MOU um, are, are very minimal. Um, the main thing is that we're looking to extend the, the MOU term from two years to 10 years, um, as well as we included some language um, that includes the words, but not limited to um, in the capital improvements that are planned for the park, such that it is not uh, just the things that are specified um, in the memorandum of understanding, um, but could include some expansion of that list. And finally, the only other small change is the uh, requirement of a general liability policy at a minimum of $1 million. And I just wanted to add that that is not a change in the practice that we have. We currently have an insurance policy at, at that amount, but it is a change in what is included in the memorandum of understanding by stating that. Um, so overall, um, that is the change um, that's before you today to this memorandum of understanding. And I wanted to know if you had any questions about what's before you. Oh. No, no questions. Um, I'm supportive of the changes. I'm excited about um, us going to a longer term agreement with Mitchellville. Um, so uh, from my desk, I'm, I'm ready to move. I agree. Any questions? No questions. Patsy? I agree, and uh, for the motion, I, I move that we uh, uh, move this forward to the town council and recommend extending the memorandum of understanding as set forth in our agenda. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Um, before, okay, you have a second? Thank you, Alex. And are there any public comments? Thank you, Messi. Good morning, Chair Becker. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, Chair Becker and the committee. Uh, really short. Again, my name is Ahmad Ward, Executive Director for Historic Mitchell for the record. Uh, we are just thankful for the support of uh, the Community Service Committee and, of course, the Town Council over the course of the years. Uh, this agreement will allow us to undergird this relationship as we move forward with capital projects, which will start this calendar year. So it is very feasible that at the end of uh, 2023, you may have three different things going on at once. Uh, getting us closer to our end goal of having the full part actualized and finished here. I want to acknowledge our board chair, Lola Campbell, and our planning and operations committee chair, Nancy Contell, in the back. We just extend our thanks for this long-term relationship with the town. We're looking forward uh, to more of a beautiful relationship to go forward to get this thing built and ready to open. Uh, and last but not least, I want to invite you officially, a little, little plug here, to our Blue Barbecue on March 25th. Please uh, let us know we have spaces for you because of our relationship. So just contact our office. We'll make sure that you get seated there. So thank you for your time, and we appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or from the public? No? Hearing none, um, Sendaya, will you please call the roll? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bryson? Yes. Mr. Brown? Support. Mr. Alfred? Yes. Ms. Becker? Yes. Motion carries. Right. And then last but not least, we have a consideration of amendments to the calendar year 2023 Community Service and Public Safety Committee's meeting schedule. Has anyone, everyone had an opportunity to review those dates? Do you have a copy there? I do. Do you like to? There we are. And these um, date changes are being uh, put forth as a way to do our business in a timely way and then move on to the town council, what gets approved here for consideration um, so that we are moving more efficiently and uh, more swiftly uh, through our work. Any, um, is there a motion to accept the amended calendar date schedule? 
And just for the public to know, we're moving from the fourth Monday of each month at 10 a.m. to the third Monday of each month at 10 a.m., except for uh, with regard to June 19, being that's a holiday that will be on June 12th. So. Right. And subject also to special meetings and any other reason that we might need to convene, um, these are the dates that will be um, officially on our calendar. So if I can get a motion to, um, rec to approve these changes. So moved. Second? I'll second. Thank you. Any comment from the public? Seeing none, Sendaya, will you please call the roll? Certainly. Ms. Bison? Yes. Mr. Brown? Support. Mr. Alfred? Yes. Ms. Beck? Yes. Thank you. Okay, and if there's no other business to come in. Madam Chair, if I could ask just a yes, couple of quick questions. Sure. Um, I think it'd be helpful. Um, Ms. Lewick is here. She reported to the town council on um, the housing framework, um, and that uh, she's working with a consultant on the housing action committee. Um, and then we also have a proposal for an advisory committee for short-term rentals. And I think we just need to inquire about the process and and how those will move along. Um, so if we could ask the mayor and town manager. And, and Ms. Lewick, you don't need to come and make another report. Thank you for what you did before. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, is looking at the complete streets policy and when that might come before us. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention is seeing an article um, in the Island Packet or perhaps the Post and Courier about Horry County and Myrtle Beach adopting a new lifeguard policy where, um, and because of an incident that they had, a lawsuit that was filed against um, one or both of them with regards, um, and, and um, sorry that Mr. Bromwich has left now, um, but um, b because our lifeguards, the beach services, uh, do both uh, lifeguarding and rental of chairs and umbrellas, um, whether or not that's a distraction, whether or not those two services should be separated. And since we have um, the summer season coming up pretty soon, I don't know when we renew or if we've already renewed our agreement, but I think it's something we ought to talk about because a number of coastal communities are looking at that change. Okay, thank you. Zendaya, can you make sure that we get a note on that so I can do some follow-up and bring those um, issues forward? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Anything else? No, ma'am. Alex, you good? Uh, Steve? All right, and then I move to adjourn. All right.